vida con, con la labor que hago, porque no se hace en México, ¿no? Pero siento que si tocas el corazón de una persona, estás ayudando también a muchas. Dices, sí funciona, estoy trabajando bien, es el camino. Patsy Ordóñez is one of hundreds of thousands of Laureate graduates who are positively impacting lives around the world through their study of medicine, education, engineering, and many other important fields. When Laureate's graduates and students succeed, our cities and nations thrive. We are here for good. Podes ver a árvore ou a floresta? Ser espectador o protagonista, rebanho ou rebelde, mostrar os dentes ou mostrar serviço, contestar ou construir, ser a continuidade ou a ruptura, o problema ou a solução, cruzar os braços ou cruzar o mundo, ser mais um ou valer por dez, copiar ou ser copiado, seguir a história ou fazê-la, pode escrever o peixe ou a cana, a decisão é tua. De que tamanho queres o mundo? I am very honored to be associated with the Laureate universities around the world. You can come here and go to school. When you leave here, you know you will be connected to the positive aspects of our future. Across the world, in 30 countries, at over 75 institutions, on hundreds of campuses around the globe, and online. In the hearts of over 800,000 students, there lives a dream. Mi sueño es convertirme en un gran diseñador. Meu sonho é ser uma diretora de arte. Work in an international advertising agency. Benim hayalim görüntü yönetmeni olmaktı. A dream of transformation through higher education. I'm shaping the mold of the future. I'm painting the picture of tomorrow. We are Laureate International Universities, the largest, most trustworthy network of higher education institutions in the world. Our reach is wide. Our network is vast. Our priority is trust. And we earn it by putting students first. A lot of our work is done in Latin America and Asia in places where the difference between getting an education and not is the difference between a successful life and perhaps a, a missed opportunity. We're where students need us most, throughout the Americas, North, Central, and South. From the Middle East to the Far East, to the heart of Old World Europe, to Africa. We're equipping students with the career-oriented education they need to advance their lives Throughout our network, students pursue more than 130 career-focused degree programs in a wide variety of professional fields. This education is very specialized and it's personal. With a network like no other and incredible online resources, Laureate Universities connect students around the globe. Having had a passion for technology my whole life, I always felt that technology had the potential to transform education. Friends make a network and they talk to you about Laureate. The network of universities and students has greatly impacted my education. With state-of-the-art facilities, an emphasis on multi-generational learning, more affordable exchange programs. You share a global village with so many people, thousands of millions of people. We don't just bring Laureate students to the world. We bring the world to Laureate Universities, top leaders who inspire our students to make a difference, and serving as Honorary Chancellor of Laureate International Universities, President Bill Clinton. Creative cooperation, that's what works in the modern world. And I like very much what the global network of Laureate Universities does. You get a good education. Second, it's a good investment for what you get. And third, you're globally connected to all the other universities so that you can learn together from each other. We educate locally and connect globally. Our architecture and design programs teach sustainability. We provide clinical services to hundreds of thousands of people who would otherwise not have access to healthcare. Civic engagement and social responsibility are at the heart of everything we do. And through our support of the International Youth Foundation, we are recognizing, 
training and supporting the young leaders of tomorrow. These are the faces of success, the ones who remind us that there is no higher calling than higher education. Because when students trust us to change their lives, we have a chance to change the world. Laureate International Universities is the world's leading higher education network. Our more than 70 institutions in 29 countries and online are educating nearly 800,000 young people and empowering our students and graduates to address the world's most pressing social issues. We are committed to having a lasting positive impact on the communities we serve. We are here for good. This is just one of the many stories of how Laureate's graduates are affecting lives around the world. Nací aquí en la Ciudad de México, en el Distrito Federal, y he vivido mis 25 años en esta ciudad tan grande. Hay mucho que hacer, hay muchas necesidades, hay mucha gente que requiere de, de nuestra ayuda. En México, el 80% de las mujeres tienen virus del papiloma humano y la mayoría de ellas no lo saben. El virus del papiloma humano es el responsable del cáncer cervicouterino. En México, el cáncer cervicouterino es la segunda causa de muerte. Es muy preocupante para mí porque el virus del papiloma humano se puede prevenir y el cáncer cervicouterino es el único cáncer que se puede prevenir y la fórmula es muy básica. Y lamentablemente nos está costando mucho trabajo concientizar y fomentar esta cultura del cuidado ginecológico. Y es por eso que decido emprender una fundación. De hecho, ahorita viene tu, la doctora. Y... Ah, okay. uh -huh. Sí, está bien. ¿Sí? Los doctores que trabajan en la fundación son voluntarios y es por eso que la clínica sigue funcionando. Nos gusta trabajar con mujeres líderes en sus comunidades para poder beneficiar a las mujeres con la prevención del cáncer cervicouterino. Estamos hablando de comunidades con gente con mucha necesidad, gente que no tiene recursos para poder hacerse un estudio y pues sabes de casos que tienen algún cáncer y que nunca se han ido a atender. Realizamos campañas de vacunación y empezamos hace poco con atención ginecológica. Las mujeres que son detectadas con cáncer cervicouterino se van a hospitales privados a realizarles todo su tratamiento por cáncer sin costo alguno. Realmente inicié sin nada, ¿no? con muchas ganas, con cero recursos. Pero llegó un momento en que no tenía una guía para seguir y al entrar al incubador VM me ayudó a hacer mi plan de negocios y tener esa guía para tener las bases al momento de salir. Nuestro trabajo aquí es encontrar al alumno talentoso, llevarlo a que su idea se concrete realmente, que ésta tenga una oportunidad en el mercado y que esa empresa perdure para beneficio del emprendedor, de sus empleados y de nuestro país. En Estados Unidos, un empresario en promedio tiene 12 generaciones de empresarios en su familia. En México no llegamos a dos, a las universidades y ciertamente a las incubadoras. Generar algo que sustituya esa cultura empresarial que los empresarios no están pudiendo obtener en sus propias familias.
Pachi se ha convertido para la universidad en un modelo a seguir. Es ejemplo para todos los emprendedores y hoy día es mentora de nuevos emprendedores que pueden o no tener una fundación. Yo tenía 22 años cuando decidí iniciar la fundación. Mucha gente me decía, para tener una fundación debes de tener dinero, debes de, de ser rica o tener grandes contactos. Solamente escuché mi corazón, que fue el que me dijo, adelante. No todos se dedican a eso. Tu mamá está bien orgullosa de ti. ¿Mm? Gracias. Muchas felicidades. Pues yo me siento muy comprometida muy comprometida con, con la labor que hago, porque no se hace en México, ¿no? Pero siento que si tocas el corazón de una persona, estás ayudando también a muchas. Dices, sí funciona, estoy trabajando bien, es el camino. Patsy Ordóñez is one of hundreds of thousands of Laureate graduates who are positively impacting lives around the world through their study of medicine, education, engineering, and many other important fields. When Laureate's graduates and students succeed, our cities and nations thrive. We are here for good. Podes ver a árvore ou a floresta? Ser espectador o protagonista, rebanho ou rebelde, mostrar os dentes ou mostrar serviço, contestar ou construir, ser a continuidade ou a ruptura, o problema ou a solução, cruzar os braços ou cruzar o mundo, ser mais um ou valer por dez, copiar ou ser copiado, seguir a história ou fazê-la, podes querer o peixe ou a cana, a decisão é tua. De que tamanho queres o mundo? I am very honored to be associated with the Laureate universities around the world. You can come here and go to school. When you leave here, you know you will be connected to the positive aspects of our future. Across the world, in 30 countries, at over 75 institutions, on hundreds of campuses around the globe, and online. In the hearts of over 800,000 students, there lives a dream. Mi sueño es convertirme en un gran diseñador. Meu sueño es ser una directora de arte. Work in an international advertising agency. Benim hayalim görüntü yönetmeni olmaktı. A dream of transformation through higher education. I'm shaping the mold of the future. I'm painting the picture of tomorrow. We are Laureate International Universities, the largest, most trustworthy network of higher education institutions in the world. Our reach is wide. Our network is vast. Our priority is trust. And we earn it by putting students first. A lot of our work is done in Latin America and Asia in places where the difference between getting an education and not is the difference between a successful life and perhaps a, a missed opportunity. We're where students need us most, throughout the Americas, North, Central, and South. From the Middle East to the Far East, to the heart of Old World Europe, to Africa.
entrada do grupo na Universidade Europeia permitiu-nos, acima de tudo, o acesso às melhores práticas a nível internacional, o acesso a conteúdos, o acesso a docentes e uma partilha de experiências globais ao nível dos estudantes, dos docentes e de toda a comunidade da Universidade Europeia. Esta universidade é nossa, é vossa e é de todos. Boa tarde. Senhores Ministros, sen Senhores Secretários de, de Estado, Senhores Embaixadores, Senhores Reitores e Presidentes de Universidades, Senhores Presidentes de Câmaras Municipais, Senhores Chefes de Gabinete e Assessores, Senhores Presidentes e Diretores Gerais de Empresas Presentes, Senhores Membros do Board Advisory da Universidade Europeia, caros docentes e demais colaboradores, caros estudantes, antigos estudantes da Universidade Europeia, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. É uma honra receber-vos na Universidade Europeia. Nos últimos três anos, a nossa instituição, que tem como visão ser uma Universidade Internacional de Referência, teve a possibilidade de organizar mais de 100 eventos, entre iFutures, a Executives, Fórum Alfa, em que diversos líderes partilharam com os nossos estudantes as suas experiências de vida, garantindo o reforço da sua integração com o mundo real. A concretização do evento de hoje prova, uma vez mais, a força do sonhar. O facto de termos conseguido fazer este evento resulta do que é panágio da Universidade Europeia, um espírito incrível de resiliência, e fazer passar os nossos sonhos para a realidade. I'm proud in honor to president to present President Bill Clinton, the 42nd president of the United States and honorary chancellor of Laureate International Universities to share with us his perspective about the global economic situation. Please welcome to the president. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson, for the introduction. Thank you for the warm welcome. I thank the rector and the other members of the university community for making me feel welcome. Uh, that the Minister of Education and the other Ministers of Government who are here, the head of the Socialist Party, the American Ambassador, thank you for being here, and all the other members of the diplomatic community. I am very glad to be back in Portugal. Someone asked me the other, when I was here earlier today why I didn't come more often, and I said, I can only come if I'm invited. Whenever I'm asked, I show up. <laughs> I was delighted when, uh, when Laureate University Networks became involved with this university. And as all of you know, it, the name was changed recently, and it was the first new private university in Portugal in 20 years. And I think the prospects for the future are great. So the people I'm most happy to see here are the students, and I thank them for coming in substantial numbers. I would like to talk a, a little today about the economy, obviously, but what it means to all of you who are students here and to this country over the long run. Uh, I spend my life now trying to support networks of positive interdependence. That's what I call it. We live in the most interdependent age in human history. And when Portugal's economy went into a tailspin after the international financial crisis was triggered by the collapse of the mortgage market in the United States, I apologize. 
And then the banking crisis in America qu spread quickly to the UK and even as far away as Iceland, where the banks were even more leveraged than they were in America. For a brief period, China lost 35 million manufacturing jobs because Europe and America couldn't buy their products for a while. And all of the Eurozone was thrown into a tailspin, but it was particularly difficult for Portugal and Spain and Ireland and Italy and various reconstruction plans were adopted which were wildly unpopular with people because we all like to borrow money and we hate to pay it back. And we like to bet on the future when it works out well and we're always sad when we bet on the future and it doesn't work out well. The first thing I want to say is that I think Portugal has done a remarkable job as a nation across the board. People without regard to party, management, labor, everybody working your way back to the point where growth can occur and you can chart a new future. But the point I want, the larger point is this. That financial crisis reflected global interdependence. Something starts somewhere, it affects people everywhere else. And they, people were affected all over the world, on every continent, which simply means that interdependence can be good or bad or both. So I will give you the end of my speech at the beginning to all the students. You cannot avoid living in an interdependent world. Therefore, the main task of every citizen in every country, everyone who wants to revive the community economy, the national economy to give children a better future, everyone who wants to build big international cooperative efforts and make world peace, and all points in between, the main task is to define the terms of our interdependence, to build up the positive forces and reduce the negative ones. You cannot expect this will be easy, that it will be free of difficulty, that there will be no disappointments and failures and simply errors along the way. But since we cannot reverse the interdependent world, no matter what the EU elections to the parliament may indicate to the contrary. The real struggle is to define the terms of our interdependence. So how are we going to do that? And how does Portugal fit into that? And how does your future fit into that? Well, the first thing I would say is that even though Europe has a horrible job shortage that falls too heavily on the young. The unemployment rate among young people who have a degree from a university is less than one-third the unemployment rate of those who do not. Therefore, the most important personal economic strategy over the long run is to make sure that you maximize your chances to be able to contribute to the world of today and tomorrow. I believe that. It's also true in the United States, by the way, where we have a horrible problem with the cost of university education and more and more young people dropping out before they get their degree because of their debt and they're worried that they won't be able to pay it. It's a problem I tried to make go away when I was there, and we made a lot of progress, but it's now gotten bad again. Still, today, a study was released which shows that the income difference between a young American with a four-year degree and without one 
is twice what it was when I was president. So this matters. If you want to be in a position to define the world in positive terms, you have to be empowered to do it, and the right sort of education empowers you to do it. Second point I want to make. In the world we live in, what we should be working for, since we are condemned to share the future, is the right sort of sharing. We have to have shared opportunities, shared prosperity, and shared responsibilities. In order to do that, we have to do the most difficult thing of all, reflected in the drama that paid out in the recent European elections. We have to build cultures of freedom in which what is different about us is respected and honored, and which people are free to define themselves, have their identity respected, but believe that our common humanity matters more. I believe at the core of almost every conflict is un an unresolved question that lurks in the heart of virtually everyone, which is whether what matters more our interesting differences are our common humanity. And what practical implications do, does that have for the future? Now, here's the way I analyze all this. And most of my life is spent not doing what I'm doing today. Most of my life now is with my foundation and the work we do around the world. We sell the world's most inexpensive, high-quality AIDS medicine in 70 countries. And more than half the people in the world alive on that medicine got it off the contracts we negotiated. We have healthcare projects in 40 countries, trying to build systems that will enable developing countries to become free of foreign assistance. We have supply chain and distribution chain projects at the bottom of the economic pyramid to economically empower low-income people in Africa and Latin America and Asia. So I work on all this, but here's how I see this. Most of the time when I was in politics, people debated two questions. What are you going to do? You're going to cut taxes or increase spending. What are you going to increase spending on? What are you going to do and how much money are you going to spend on it? Or how much cut are you going to take? There was very little attention given to the third question, which I believe will be the most important of all, because as Portugal is just experienced, Sometimes we have no control over what we do in an interdependent world from a financial point of view. Sometimes we have to pull in. Sometimes we have the opportunity to expand. The most important question is, whatever you're going to do and however much money you have or do not have, how do you propose to do it? How do you propose to turn what is in your head and your heart into real changes in your own life and the lives of people you seek to advance. So here's my take on that. This interdependent world is a really great deal for a lot of people. Like, look at all the students here. And it's probably a much more diverse crowd than it would have been, even this whole crowd. If someone like me had come to Portugal to give a speech 30 years ago, would this be the venue and would this be the crowd? No, the crowd would look too much like me. Old gray-haired men in suits. Look, by the way, I look around the crowd, I, I thank you for not eliminating my group entirely from this crowd. 
we're laughing, but it's an interesting world. It's a more diverse world. It's a more connected world. It's interdependent in far more than economic terms. The, the, the information technology revolution has changed everything. Those of us who really care about the abduction of those girls by the Boko Haram in Nigeria can practically follow every move of the people chasing them. It, it, but it brings us together. There are three serious problems with the interdependent world. It is too unequal in terms of access to education, health care, capital to start new business, employment, and income. If you believe in market economics, and I do, you accept that some inequality is not only necessary but positive. You want to reward people who are good at certain things. And if you believe that in order for some to succeed, the possibility of failure has to exist in a competitive economy, then you accept some instability. The problem is manifested by the financial crisis and what Portugal had to endure afterward. If there is too much instability and too much inequality, it's like having none at all. Everything shuts down. Nobody wants to invest any money. Nobody wants to loan any money. One of the big challenges Portugal will have to face now, having escaped the uh, financial uh, chains that were on you and done everything you can to basically be in charge of your own economic destiny again, is what to do about the existing private debt and how to restructure it so that uh, the companies here in Portugal can borrow money again to invest and grow and create jobs. Big challenge. So that's the first thing I want to say. There's too much inequality, too much instability. Instability also extends to politics. We all know when someone gets killed by a terrorist act. But I'll, I'll take it to something that has nothing to do with uh, your conflicts now. If you followed closely just the headlines in the relationship between the United States and Mexico, our southern neighbor, and if I passed out a piece of paper to all of you and I ask you, tell me what you read about Mexico and the U.S. in the last five years, you would almost certainly say, they're always fighting over immigration. And the drug lords are killing a lot of people in Mexico. It's huge violence. You could make movies from now to the end of time about it. Right? I mean, you've always read that. Here's what you, therefore, might not know. In 2010 and 2011, we had the only two years in my lifetime when there was zero net migration from Mexico into the United States because Mexico was creating so many economic opportunities for its own people. In the first decade of this new century, Mexico and Brazil, long the most economically unequal countries in the Americas, actually had a decline in income inequality, a dramatic movement of people out of poverty into the middle class, while inequality increased in the United States. And by the way, when you read about all that drug violence, it was really true, but the overall crime rate and the overall murder rate in Mexico was going down. Last year, coming back to your education, the United States graduated 120,000 people with engineering degrees from our universities. Mexico is just a little more than one-third our population. The previous president, Mr. Calderon, established 140 tuition-free universities, which last year produced 113,000 engineers. In other words, almost as many as we did. So. This is a little study hint for your future in the test of real life. Don't always look at the headlines. Look at the trend lines and see if underneath the 
headline, something is going on that people are not picking up. So I say that wherever people are working to reduce inequality and instability and to make good things happen, they're having some success. In Nigeria, where all the problems with the Boko Haram occur, one of their biggest problems is the Lagos region. Nigeria is basically a country in three regions with a lot of independent regional governments. But in, in the southern part in Lagos, about a quarter of the people live in poverty by global standards. In the middle part, the Niger Delta, which was originally where most of the energy was and the oil was, about 40% do. In northern Nigeria, where the Boko Haram operates and is trying to keep all the girls out of school, the extreme poverty rate is about 70%. Too much inequality creates a lot of this instability and fuels a lot of this identity-based politics. But Nigeria is also doing some remarkable things. It is the home to an experiment our foundation is doing. Where my daughter and I kicked off uh, last year. We're trying to save one million lives of children under five from waterborne diseases, cholera, dysentery, diarrhea. To do that, you have to take packets of oral rehydration therapy and zinc and go way into the areas, including the remote forest where these girls are being held. So far, none of the young people working for us up there have been killed trying to save the lives of children under five years of age. Only point I'm trying to make is that you have to look to see what is going on. If there are people are doing things to reduce inequality, to reduce instability, and in the process, to widen our sense of community, to give people things to be for in common, to do in common, you're going to get better results than where people are fighting all the time, where people think their differences are the most important thing. The next thing I'd like to say is that I believe it's important to recognize that intelligence and effort are pretty well even, and aspirations, hopes, dreams, they're pretty well evenly distributed throughout the world. But since opportunities aren't, the interdependent world looks a lot uglier than it should. And so I would urge all of you to think about, again, what if anything you can do about it, first in Portugal and then beyond your borders. I'll give you an example. We do a lot of work uh, in healthcare in Southern Africa, including in Mozambique, a former Portuguese colony. This is a wonderful place. We do a lot of farming work. In Tanzania, in our, we are, we just opened a farm to help 20,000 very small farmers who farm about an acre. prove that they can grow food competitively with big farms and that they should not be thrown off their land. One of the biggest problems in Africa today is they have more arable land than any other continent not yet developed, but that a lot of wealthy countries like Saudi Arabia and China that can, they have a lot of money and can't feed themselves, instead of buying food, want to go and lease food, lease land or buy land in African countries, mechanize the farms, throw the small farmers off the land, and contribute to instability, and do nothing to reduce inequality. So what we try to do is to go into these places and empower the farmers to be truly productive. You say, oh, it's impossible. They're farming an acre of land. They've got a hoe. That's their tool. But we started in Malawi, then we spread to Tanzania. Our first 20,000 farmers 
that we got better seed, better fertilizer, lower cost, took the food to market, stored it so it didn't get destroyed, kept them from being ripped off from transport costs. And they doubled by more than double eight. They, their production went up two and a half fold on all the land, even the tiniest plots. And their incomes went up twice that. Can think of that. The average increase in income with our farm project for these poor farmers was 576% in one year. And by the way, there are innovation opportunities like that in developed countries too. That's why I'm glad you've got a minister of innovation in the government. There are lots of opportunities to make more things happen. I say that to say the, these farmers, many of whom I have actually looked in the eye, once something like that happens, they're far less likely to pick up a gun. When they believe that their tomorrows can be better than today, they're more likely to be part of your community. So here you are, Portugal's out of the financial straitjacket, well on the way to dramatically increasing exports as a percentage of your GDP, but you have to figure out a way to go from 1% growth to 3% growth if you want to, or 2%, 2 2.5% 2 if you want to get the wages going again and you want to make up for the lost time of the, that with, through no fault of your own you had to endure. Would it be a good thing if the EU fell apart? which is what some of the people were saying in the European election. I don't think so, but that you have to, there has to be a theory in Europe that helps all the countries and helps the people in the countries. It doesn't see the country without seeing the people and whether they can make a decent living and whether they can do that. I have found it quite rewarding to be out of political office free to concentrate. I have less power, but I have more opportunity to focus on things that I think are really important. Whether you get an education is really important. No politician, no economic strategy, nobody can take you into the 21st century and give you the chance to fully realize your potential unless you do that for yourself. So the obligation of the government, and to some extent, and the private sector, is to create the opportunities for you to do that. Then we have to come up with economic strategies that have a reasonable chance to generate more employment. And yes, it's true that technology allows fewer people to do more work every year. And so in any given area, you may not need as many jobs to get the same output. But always before in human history, Every technological investment has led to the creation of so many new areas of opportunity that the number of jobs have increased. That hasn't happened yet, partly because we haven't yet worked through all the debt issues, partly because we don't have the proper investment strategy. And I hope that both Europe and its constituent parts, especially Germany, will be able to come up with a strategy to do that. I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic for the United States that's had 10 bad years in terms of job creation. We're, we have recovered all we lost now, and we're trying to, we're going forward, and that's good. But I, I ask you to think of, about where you fit in this big picture. You live in an interdependent world. It's good and bad. You can't do anything about it. You can't escape it. So you have to build up the good and reduce the bad. You are defining the terms of interdependence. I believe running away from everybody else is not an option. I understand it, but it's not an option. And here's the last thing I want to say. I, I, I see what all the, when I think of all the anti-immigrant parties and all the intensity here. I spent $3 billion of American taxpayers' money to finish our part of an international effort to sequence the human genome. That happened in 2000. 
we've already gotten $180 billion worth of economic benefit from it, by the way. But here's the most important thing. In spite of all the advances that are now coming forward to help us cure disease, politically, as a citizen, the most important thing all of you should know about the Genome Project is that every non-age-related difference you can see in this room, let's look around the room, every difference, including gender, except age, which, alas, you can't do anything about. Every other difference is rooted in one half of 1% one of your genome. In other words, we are all 99.5% the same. And yet our brains work in a way that lead us to spend 99.5% of our time thinking about the half a percent of ourselves that is different. And I'm not just talking about politics. Oh, I wish I were a little taller or a little this or a little that or a little the other thing. You cannot afford that anymore. You've got to make slightly more than one half a percent of your consciousness available to think about what we have in common. And we have to think about what we have to give up to get more. If this is just me, I don't know, but I think if you want all these companies to be able to invest in Portugal and create more jobs now that you've gone through your financial straitjacket, I think you've got to figure out a way to restructure a lot of their debt so they can do it productively. And just having an outright default and causing the bank's trouble is not the answer. So you're going to have to, this is something you're going to have to do together. There is no shotgun answer where there's one bad person and another perfect person. We've got to get the country together and come up with a common sense policy to do it. We didn't do a very good job in America, and it slowed us down for about two and a half years. And now we kind of got it in a manageable place. But that's the last thing I want to say, and then we'll go to questions. If you look around the world, wherever people are working together in creative networks of cooperation, good things are happening. They often do not make the news because they're good. Wherever people believe their differences matter more than their common humanity, and they fight like cats and dogs, not much good is happening. You're here, the students, every single day that you learn more and grow more and relate to people you hadn't known before more, you're making something good happen. You're becoming a citizen of an interdependent world more likely to succeed. Now you have to figure out how to take your experience and figure out how to apply it beyond the confines of the university community, the city you live in, the nation you live in, even the continent you live in. We are condemned to share the future. We had better do a better job defining the terms of our sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Presid President Clinton, uh, for your thoughtful remarks. We have now a few questions for you. And um, my, first, my first question, it is, in your opinion, um, what are the core competencies uh, that a university must provide to the students so they can be a global, a global professional in the future? Well, first of all, I think there is, in every uh, area, there is a threshold level of knowledge 
about the subject at hand that is important to acquire. But secondly, we, we know since there'll always be more knowledge on the internet than we'll ever have in our brains, that it's also even more important to know how to find out things and how to use it. I, th I think the most important thinking skill today is synthesizing. If you pick up any newspaper in any country in the world on any given day, it will look like the political equivalent of chaos theory in physics. A boat sinks in North Korea. We can't find a Malaysian plane. The girls are kidnapped in Nigeria. Steel production is up in eastern Ukraine or whatever. You know, the, the point is not the facts, but you, you know, just look at it tomorrow and ask yourself, you know, how do all these things relate to each other? So I believe it's going to be very important for people to develop the ability to have a framework, a filter through which they pass all information and then organize the world. That's why if you ask me a question today, any question like, how do you stand on this issue? I ask myself, will this reduce inequality and instability and strengthen the bonds of community? Will it create networks of cooperation or will it tear them apart? If it will do the things I believe should be done, then I'm for that course of action. If it won't, I'm not. And so I think we all need that. Synthetic intelligence, you need to be able to analyze and think creatively about it. The third thing I think is important is that, uh, and this is, can't be handled by online education, although I do believe that we'll be able to lower the delivery cost of much higher education and maintain the quality if we do a good job with these MOOC, the massive online open courses. But one of the reasons I like it when young people go to universities and are physically together with people who are different from them, who have different, and I just, that's, you have to learn by living what it's like to deal with people who think differently than you, feel differently than you, have practices different than yours. I think that's an incredibly important thing that every university should consciously advance making sure that all of its graduates, when they finished, will have had some contact with people of different racial, ethnic, religious, political, geographical backgrounds. Because if you have that, if you have that, if you can think creatively and problem solve, if you can understand other people and work with them so that you have cooperation instead of conflict and if you can organize apparently unrelated facts into reasonable patterns so that you can use the information to make sensible decisions if you can do those three things then you have got quite a good education and preparation for life thank you thank you um like you like you comment in your remarks um then employment and the youth unemployment it's um it's really a global challenge that we have to, to address. And in Portugal, the youth unemployment rate, it is almost 37.5%. Uh, but in among of the people with university education, um, the unemployment rate, it's almost 11%. In your opinion, what, what are the same, the same key things that a university or as a country must to do to, to convince the young people, to convince the people to invest in, in a university education as a, a point of differences for the, for the upward of the social mobility? Well, first of all, you've got to make sure 100% of the young people know that statistic. I mean, you're laughing, but you'd be amazed what 
people who make decisions know and take for granted that you know that may not be known. I'll just give you an example. If you took a poll in the United States today, you said the government's deficit is still too high. What should we do about it? The first thing the public would say, literally after 30 years of people like me talking till we're blue in the face about it, they'd say, cut foreign aid. Foreign aid is only 1% of the American budget. If you took a poll in America and you said, how much do we spend on foreign aid? They would, how much should we spend? The same people who say cut it would say, we should spend about 5% of the budget on foreign aid. How much do we spend? Oh, 10 to 15, it's too much. So they're off by a factor of 10 to 15. When I was president, I talked about this. It does not matter. It did not register. And so I'm not sure that every young person in Portugal has heard or believed or can psychically accept that their chances of being unemployed are three times higher if they don't go on to university. So the first thing you got to do is do more affirmative education and outreach and then make sure that they can navigate the years they're in university and meet their other obligations and all like that. Then I think you need to examine the transition years and the schooling years and see whether more can be done before they get to university to both prepare them for holding a job should they not go to university as well as prepare them for qualifying for a job. I am, uh, I, uh, President Obama went to a, a high school in New York recently to visit a school that holds the young people a year longer but gives them a specific job training so they have that plus their academic training. My favorite school, and, I, and you know, I live in New York so I'm more familiar with that, is a school that is simply a regular high school. That is, you get out at the same time everybody else in America does, but it is centered around New York Harbor. And every young person who graduates has a certificate in a maritime science, scuba diving, aquaculture, harbor master of boats, and there are two others, I can't remember. You have to pick one of five. But they guarantee you, you will get a job if you get this certificate. And at the same time, they have the academic credits to get into any four-year university. So you also are guaranteed, if you graduate from this school, you can get into a four-year university. And I think that, you know, a lot of people when they're young, they just don't know what they want to do. I mean, I didn't, they mostly want to live and figure out what's going on out there and wander around a little bit. And I think it would be really good if we could do a better job in developed countries in preparing people both for the jobs that are available and for entry into four-year universities and then just hammer this employment difference. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I really think just because everybody in this room knows that the unemployment rate among young people without a college degree is more than three times higher than it is for those with a college degree doesn't mean that every person that you want to know that fact knows it. And it's very important that we don't, I have been humbled a hundred times in my public life by making the arrogant error that just because I knew some fact, everybody else did, accepted it, and it absorbed its meaning. It's simply not true. It's harder than that. Thank you. We Thank you. We, ha we have now uh, questions from, from our students, and I will ask to Marta to stand up. Hello, Marta. 
Uh, Marta is a student of our master's degree program in digital marketing. And the question of, Mar of Marta it is, uh, in the global economy, uh, it's more complicated and it's more complicated now and very interconnected than ever. Um, what, in your opinion, are the same, the same key things that we must be done to build more cohesion uh, across the global economic system? Well, I think first of all, I said this before, I'll say it again. I think it's a good thing that Portugal has a government minister with a portfolio of innovation. I think, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible to start a business. The barriers to entry should be low. The barriers to entry to, there should be some, we find in the United States we have to have some public support to get many small businesses started. But this company, Laureate, is headquartered in Baltimore. And it's, uh, it's one of two great American companies that have been started there in the last several years. The other one is called Under Armour. And a lot of you may know Under Armour started as uh, clothing for athletes that drives in a hurry. They now have thousands of employees all over the world in just a little over a decade. And they occupy massive sections of the big harbor in Baltimore. They started with a small business administration loan and made $17,000 their first year. And so, I think you have to have that. The, the other thing I think is very important, we're having this big debate now, I think you have to keep the internet and access to it as free as possible if you want to do digital online businesses and marketing. And I think that there has to be within every country, it should be easier for you here because it's not big, a real effort to have universal access, and universal access not just to the internet, but to really rapid broadband. It has a big impact. No one asked me this since I've been in Portugal, because I think you've, you've had so many national problems. But in most countries, there are dramatic geographic differences in how this economy is playing out. So that, for example, <clears throat> One of the challenges we face in America is that President Obama can have a infrastructure initiative, which he does, and I strongly support it. And you see where it's working, and it's bringing a lot of jobs. And it's thrilling. But there are all these places in America, which are small towns and rural areas, where the, the way they used to make a living was in some kind of mining or some kind of other manufacturing that's long gone. And because they don't have a connection, either physical or virtual, to the modern economy, it's impossible to bring investment there that will generate enough employment to let them participate in the economic life of the country. So, that's the other thing. There's all this fighting going on, you know, about what should be done to the internet, internet access, who should pay what to do it. All I can tell you is I think the freer it is, the better. You want, especially, you want to make it as easy as possible to start new businesses, to aggregate young talent, and promote innovation. The final thing I would say is I think every country should have some kind of research and innovation fund which enables it to, to get people started trying new and really promising things. Because this is like this Under Armour thing, it's amazing. They made $17,000 the first year. Now they've got thousands of employees all over the world. They hired a woman from West Virginia in one of these rural, high unemployment, low income areas I told you about. She was the first person sewing the sporting clothes. She still works every day. 
but she's worth $7 million now because they gave her stock. And so she wanted to keep working. That's the promise of the innovation economy. And I think you, you got it. But I, I think there, there needs to be a public-private innovation strategy that lets people like you loose and keeps access to the internet free and fast and makes the most rapid broadband speeds available everywhere. One big problem in the US, it may not be a problem here, is that South Korea is the fastest country in the world in broadband download. Their average broadband download speeds is four times ours because we have centers of blinding access and speed and massive small towns and rural areas virtually left out of it. You don't need that. You need to get everybody involved. There may be somebody really smart who's not under this tent today <laughs> out there. In fact, the chances of that is 100 or 100 percent, right? So you want to make it universally available. Thank you. We have it. I will ask to Ricardo Toledo to, to stand up. Uh, Ricardo is a student of our undergrad program of human resources management. And the question of Ricardo is about corporate uh, social responsibility that normally m means many different things in different countries, in different institutions. But fundamentally, um, what does corporate social responsibility mean to you? What role should the business play in driving social prog progress? Thank you. That is a very good question. And a very important question for this university because you have a lot of, because of the kind of areas of concentration you have here. And at the risk, I, I have two friends here, so I may embarrass them, because I think they're models of corporate social responsibility. But I'll tell you what, it, to me it means three things, and should mean three things everywhere. First, corporate response, social responsibility means being a responsible corporate citizen. That is, that responsibility begins at home. How do you treat the people who work for you? not contributing to the growing inequality in society by paying your workers too little and your top management too much. Laborers all over the world have lost relative advantage because capital is mobile. And we have developed a global financial system faster than we've developed a global economic system, much less a global system of social understanding. So first, Corporate social responsibility begins at home. How do you treat your employees? How do you help the communities of which you are a part already? How do you relate to your customers? And what happens if they buy a product or a service that's not as you pledged it would be? What opportunities do you give your people starting with at the bottom and going all the way up through top management for continued development and improvement? And what opportunities do you have for continued modernization so that you can stay in business and maybe develop new avenues of earning money which will lead to employment? That's corporate social responsibility. First, you gotta be a responsible corporation. Do what you set yourself up to do and do it well and treat people right while you're doing it. Um, second, I think insofar as possible, companies that can do so should integrate things that are good for society into their for-profit business plan, not just have a pot of money over here that's good for that. I'll give you an example. When I started working on the global AIDS problem, there was no global fund against AIDS, TB, and malaria. The United States had no PEPFAR program, the best thing President Bush ever did, I think. 
So I had to go around and kind of rattle a cup and raise money. Nelson Mandela and I were doing it together. We had 10 great years together working, but in the beginning there was no money. So I decided that if I wanted to really help treat millions of people, I had to lower the cost of the medicine. And I didn't want to ask the companies that were producing the medicine, mostly in India, but one big company in South Africa, to lose money. That's not right. I never ask a responsible corporation to lose money. You can't do that. So I said, look at the AIDS market in the world. You're only giving medicine to a fraction of the people who need it to stay alive, charging $500 a person a year. It's a low volume, high profit margin, uncertain business with a lousy supply chain. I said, let's go to a high volume, low profit margin, certain payment, fine supply chain business, drive the price down, and if you don't make more money, I'll tear the contract up. I don't want you to lose money. I want you to make money in a different way. The price went from 500 to 190 to 160 to 140 to 120 dollars. Eventually to 90 for the old fashioned three dose treatment. The price of the children's medicine dropped from 600 to 60 dollars. They all made more money and millions and millions of people got medicine. I'll give you the practical numbers. Last year, uh, we were at about 5.8 million people got this medicine off the contracts our foundation negotiated. By going to these generic contracts, uh, when Hillary was Secretary of State, the United States money, first when she took office and President Obama took office, they were treating, American money was treating 1.7 million people with AIDS drugs. The day she left, we were treating 5.1 million. Three times as many for slightly less money by changing the economic model. That's corporate social responsibility. And I think it's important. Final thing is, I think it's, in, uh, again, though I was gonna say this, uh, one of my friends over here is uh, a very large provider of electricity in the Central America and the Caribbean. And he's about to open the biggest wind farm in uh, Panama in Central America. He's gonna make money. But he's also gonna fight climate change in a region that should be 100% electrified by clean energy, where the economics favor it entirely and other people aren't doing it. Now the third thing you should, uh, that represents corporate social responsibility is <clears throat> using the resources that your corporation generates, your business generates, to tackle a problem that would otherwise not be tackled or not tackled as well as you can tackle it that right now you know no other corporation can do and no other government is doing. My other friend sitting over there built a great computer company and became obsessed with the problems of the loss of species and quality water and the pollution of our oceans and so he took the wealth he generated and invested it trying to figure out how to minimize what is a very significant problem for it's too late over fish, for example, is the main source of protein for more than a billion people on Earth. So in my opinion, there are three elements to being for corporate social responsibility. Be a good corporation. Do what you set up to do and do it so you do right by your employees, your customers, your communities. Do that. Try to change your mission so that you make money in a different way that benefits society more than the way you're making money now. Don't stop making money. You can't have a business if you don't make money. And third, take some of your surplus capital and invest it in a problem that otherwise will be left without enough resources. To me, it's all three of those things.
Thank you. We have now a, a, another question. Uh, it's from Ana Catarina Mendes. Hi, Ana. Ana is a student of our undergrad program of tourism in the, the last year, in the third year. And the question of Ana, it is about Europe. Uh, there has been uh, much talk lately about the future of the, the European integration. How much do you believe of the, the European dream is over, and and why? We... And why? And why? You you believe that it's over? And no, no. I just think that if you thought it would all happen without a fight, that's naive. That is, keep in mind, this European dream involves an identity debate going on in the mind and heart of hundreds of millions of people. All subject to shifting feelings when there are economic problems, when there are political difficulties, and then all subject to being Uh, influenced by what's going on in the political debate itself. So I'll tell you what I think. I always supported the economic and political unity of Europe. I always believed that it, there had to be a very wide latitude for the recognizing the distinct characteristics of all its countries mostly self-governance and that and the only thing I told when when I was president when the euro the first euro was minted and the only thing I I told the then German Chancellor Helmut Kohl and the then French President Jacques Chirac was that if they chose to go with the euro before there was greater political alignment, it would be a truly wonderful thing for the EU as long as the global economy was growing. For example, the biggest beneficiaries, ironically, of the Greece being able to borrow money at German interest rates were German manufacturers who could then sell their products to Greece. Or Italy or whatever. But it was a risk. At the time, it seemed to be a prudent risk because nobody foresaw the collapse of the financial system that occurred. A lot of decisions were made in the early 2000s all over the world which should not have been made, which made it not a prudent risk. So what happens is, the European idea becomes less attractive when it seems to be every day a source of economic deprivation and when someone from some other country seems to be telling you how to run your affairs and gives you options which all makes you miserable. I mean that's basically the politics of all this as it works out. And then so when all that happens, and then Scotland comes along, you know, and they're going to have a vote. And they have, uh, if they were a separate country, some of the UK's offshore energy would be within Scottish territorial waters. And some of the onshore operations. So they think, hey, we can get out of the, you know, eating bitter fruit brigade and we'll have our own ticket to wealth. So all I'm saying is, that shouldn't bother you. All of this when, this, when the European idea was born, it gave rise to the prospect that for the first time since nation states arose on the continent of Europe, hundreds of years ago, that there might be democracy and peace and cooperation everywhere. 
that's why the Balkans were so important to me when I was president. That's why we had to stop the, what was going on in Bosnia, why we had to stop what was going on in Kosovo, why I wanted the Baltic states to be free and to know they would be, and all the things that happened. We were trying, all of us in the 1990s, to create a Europe that was democratic, whole, free, and united for the first time in history. But it was never going to be an easy ride. And I, I can't answer whether, uh, but, I, I, that, but I don't think this is a mortal wound. Keep in mind, if you wake up in a bad mood on the day of the European elections, you get a free vote because you know that, that uh, you can vote for the separatists or the anti-immigrants or the anti-whatever, and it won't really affect your national policy. They'll go to Brussels and debate it. It shows you that the public's sending a giant sort of blinking light of caution to the politicians. And the fact that the vote was low is also an indication of that. But I believe over the long run, the European Union is more likely to produce shared prosperity, shared responsibility for common problems, and a sense of community that allows all of you to keep your Portuguese or whatever your national identity is, your ethnic or religious identity, and still be part of a larger whole that will be more prosperous and more peaceful. That's what I think. So, but we have to, we, we those of us who are in any positions of influence, public or private, you gotta get economic growth going again. It's gotta affect the young again. And you've got to find a way to um, explain to ordinary people why all this stuff makes sense to them. But big picture, I'm still for Europe. That's the way I feel. And I'm not at all surprised that there's been a backlash. It, this stuff is not easy. The United States was founded on the promise that all people were created equal. In the 18th century, it took us 100 years and a bloody war to free the slaves. It took us another hundred years to pass legislation to guarantee that freedom was equal. Women did not have the vote in America till the early 20th century. I mean, all expansions of identity of any kind are challenging. And at its core, the European dream requires a consciousness that our identity is important, but our common humanity matters more. Always been a struggle, always will be. It's a fight worth waging, in my opinion. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. We have now just uh, our last question. It's from Gonzalo, Gonzalo Vaz. It's, it's over there. It's a student of our undergrad program of hospitality management in the second year. And the question, it is a global question. It is the rise of the China and R Russia, Brazil and India and, and other countries uh, suggest that we are entering in a post-American world and that the US will no longer be the only superpower. Um, what are your opinion about that, and what will the, what what will be the role of the West and Europe? Well, first of all, I think that's right. When I was uh, president, I had the great good fortune, in many ways, of being the first president to serve my entire terms at the end of the Cold War, when we were, by common consensus, the only military, political, and economic superpower in the world. So this was another one of those things like foreign aid. I kept telling people all along that this was a fleeting period. It couldn't last long, and it probably shouldn't last long. And that we needed to work as hard as we could 
to build a world we'd like for our children to live in when we were no longer the only economic, political, and military superpower. I mean, consider the rise of China economically. Once someone has as much money as you do to spend on defense, whether you're the only economic superpower is up to, I mean, the only military superpower is up to them, not to you. Right? The United States has utterly no control over what other people decide to spend on their own defense. So what we needed to do, I, that's why I spent so much time when I was president trying to create these networks of cooperation. I actually signed an agreement with Russia in which the Russian president promised never to upset the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And in which the Ukrainians promised in return to give up all their nuclear weapons and send them back to Russia so they could be destroyed and you could live in a safer world. And um, so that's, you know, what I think about that. I think that we still have the same job. The, the good news, if you believe in America, as I do, is that while there is not very much we can do by ourselves anymore since solving big problems requires networks of cooperation, there are very few big problems that can be solved if we don't help. And that's a, that's a good discipline for all of us to remember. We need to find a way to create networks of cooperation so that you work for the best and prepare for the worst. But it, it shouldn't bother. If you believe intelligence and hard work and aspiration, hopes and dreams are evenly distributed, it's wrong to say, I believe all that, but I want to keep a whole lot of people down so we can be the only big dog on the block. That's wrong. We should be trying to create a world where the bigger countries are forces for good, but are required to cooperate with others to make good things happen and to stop bad things from happening. And I think that's a simple thing. With China, we should work with them when we can. But we should also try, and I, I think it's really important, but we should try to keep them from running over the legitimate territorial interest of Vietnam and the rest of Southeast Asia and the Philippines. We shouldn't say that in a given region of the world, the biggest country gets to disregard international law and basic notions of fairness and the legitimate interest of other people, which is the, what the conflicts in the South China Sea are about right now. So, and I think the same thing, uh, look, in the Middle East, we're working with China and Russia and all those UN people who work together to propose those Iran sanctions, which have given us the chance to have the, the Obama administration's negotiations with the, uh, with the other countries involved, five other countries involved, to avoid a terrible development in the Middle East. If Iran becomes a nuclear power, four or five other countries will. And nuclear weapons are very expensive to build, maintain, and monitor, and, and the material is. But the point is, we think that these countries never work together. They did. They did something really important together. They passed a United Nations resolution. They set up a system that they're all participating in now. So you're going to have examples of cooperation and examples of not. But the rise of China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Poland, I could, Turkey, it is, it's all good if they are on balance responsible and responsive both to their own people, to their neighbors, and to their potential in the world. Power is more diffuse. And networks are going to have to exercise it and counter it in its negative forms. And we're just all going to have to get used to it. But, you know, I'd rather America be the uh, a leader for peace and freedom and prosperity and security than the only big superpower holding, if, if the way to do it is to hold other people down. It's wrong to keep other people down. They have the same right to their dreams and aspirations as long as they're positive and don't require them to abuse other people as, as we do. 
And that's why, by the way, that's why I disagree with what Russia's doing in Ukraine. I know a lot of those Ukrainian reformers. I never met anybody from Ukraine that wanted a bad relationship with Russia. Look at the map. All you got to do is look at the map to know if you were a Ukrainian politician, you'd be out of your mind to want to make an enemy out of Russia hovering over you geographically. What they want is to be able to be free to chart their own course and to be a bridge between Russia and the United States. And that's what we should all be trying to do. We should all be building bridges. I don't know if it's the last question, but I want to leave you with it. Since I'm at a university, I would forget it if I don't think it. So Mr. Putin's idea of defining Russian greatness is being able to control his borders, right? And using the energy that Europe needs, that Ukraine needs, to leverage that and to minimize the chance that anyone will try to counter that. And that's a very traditional, almost 19th century way of defining an empire. At least you control what they call the near abroad, their near neighbors. They do have another option. Keep in mind, male life expectancy in Russia is still under 60. The deterioration of their health care system at the end of the Cold War has still not been recovered. Every year, the great American company, IBM, sponsors a contest open to any university in the world. You could enter next year if you wanted. You could field a team to solve complex computer problems. And <clears throat> it's a very hotly contested contest every year. So when this Ukrainian business opened up, I asked my staff, I said, I said, you remember that IBM contest? Go get me the results of the last four years, the last six years. I want six years. Who were the top four finishers? The only country in the world that has had a university with a team in the top four in all six years is Russia. The only country in the world that has had two teams in the top four in three of the last six years is Russia. And the only country that had three of the top four positions in one of the last six years is Russia. If you lived in a digital age, would you try to define your, grace, your greatness in terms of occupying Crimea? Or would you try to get a rival to Silicon Valley with all these brains who are so gifted in solving computer problems to create opportunities and attract people like a magnet instead of trying to control them. Attraction is going to work better than control in an interdependent world. So I just think they made the wrong choice. I think if I were a Russian, I would want Ukraine to have a great relationship with Europe and use that as a bridge between the two countries to build a whole different kind of future. And I, so I just disagree with the decision they made for the same reason that I'm not upset about America no longer being the only behemoth in the world. It was just going to make everybody mad. Now we all have to get in the same boat and row. Thank you. So we, it's a real amazing thought uh, that you share with us today. Uh, I just want to reinforce the pride that we have to have you here with us. And I will say thank you very much to, to be with us, with, with, uh, with our students and with our community to share your vision, to share your remarks about this, this, this matter. It's a real, a real uh, thing that I believe that had been important for all of our university, and I just want to, to give a, a big th thanks to our students because uh, they are here. This is a, a tough moment. It is the exams moment, the end of the, of the year, and I believe that they, they deserve uh, applause, a special applause to, to today.
to do on their way. I, I, I want to thank you, and I, I just want to say again, I'm just an outsider. I'm not an expert on this country, but although I like Portugal very much, and I think you came through this tough period quite well. I think some things happened that you should be very proud of, and I think now you have a chance to write a different future. And I hope you'll do it, because it's a really remarkable place. And it's, um, you know, you went through all this turmoil. You didn't have any social unrest to speak of. Everybody kind of knew this stuff had to be done. So I ask you to think about what I said to you in terms of the future. You are now free to create a new future. Identify the obstacles to your growth and your opportunities and your maximizing your human potential, and go take them down. You, it's, it's a great place. You need, it's good for the world when there are countries like this that do really, really well, especially if they've been through a bad time. The, all over the world, people just need beacons of models of hope where things are working. And uh, I think your chances are pretty good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Só queria, só, só queria pedir a todos que se mantenham, que se mantenham por enquanto nos vossos lugares, está bem? É só mais um bocadinho. Muito obrigado a todos por terem vindo.